They are the people left behind after shots are fired. It hurts because I didn't get the chance to know somebody who, who's the reason why I'm on this earth. The tears wept behind closed doors. They won't step forward and just admit that they did it. Now a camera lens is being used to capture the heartache left behind by tragedy. When you're talking about 15 being the last day that a person lives because a bullet took their life, on this episode of Let's Talk Cincy, we sit down with the makers behind the Cincinnati Police Department documentary, Shoot This, Not That. We wanted to um, give them an outlet, something that would help them to express themselves, and um, the camera did it. The program putting a camera in the hands of kids whose loved one was taken by violence. How the photos they take help them through the grieving process and paint a different picture for their futures. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. Showing kids how to break the cycle of gun violence. Welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. I'm Alexis Rogers. I think we all can agree that this is a very impactful time in all of our lives. And we're coming off of a summer of a very high shooting rate. Two of those victims, just 14 years old, the Cincinnati Police Department wanted to do something to bring everyone together to try to curve this violence. We wanted to give the kids something other than guns. We wanted to um, give them an outlet, something that would help them to express themselves and um, the camera did it. Watching the kids walk in, their eyes light up to see the things that they've done. It's, it's just an amazing project that we took on with 21 Cincinnati kids. Um, these are all kids impacted by gun violence. My dad. My father. I lost my dad and my grandpa. We lost my son, Marcus Daniels, to gun violence. This is a part of their trauma. This is their aftermath. This is their everyday life. Spending 11 years as a homicide detective, you know, most of the time when we deal with the families, we're dealing with moms, sometimes dads, mostly moms, and the children seem to be forgotten. We assume that children are adaptable and resilient, and they are, but uh, they need a lot more, and we wanted to reach the kids, and this was a way through photo voice to let them express themselves and also a way to touch that no snitch mentality. The no snitch mentality hurts our community in so many ways because it allows people to hide in plain sight. No one can save us from us but us. One of the things that I think that is important to articulate is that it's oftentimes not the first time in a family that a loved one has been murdered. So you kind of see this progression, like, well, what happened or what didn't happen for this child? Why now is this child in this situation? You know, and people come up with all kind of different ideas and opinions, like, well, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's sometimes not a wrong place in a wrong time. To just be a kid in Cincinnati, to be able to go out in the park, you expect to go outside and come home. You know, these are the, the things that we just think about that you should just have these regular liberties to be able to do. And it's not always that. And you understand the context behind the numbers. Mm -hmm. What numbers do you think will surprise people the most, um, especially in this documentary, but just in general when it comes to uh, violence, especially against our youth? Wow. So I've put together some, um, some stats from like the last five years. And 2019 was um, the top of the line for us in regards to um, young adolescent. Um, murders. We've always had sort of the the baby deaths and you know that's horrific but when you're talking about 15 being the last day that a person lives because a bullet took their life it, it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to comprehend like Jim was saying like we see the mothers all the time you know we see them come out for the vigils you know we see the community outreach advocates we never really see these kids and that was one of the huge questions that we asked, like, well, where are the kids in the family? So in our unit, we, we try to go all in deep with families. We try to understand, you know, how you got to this point. You're here now, unfortunately, but how do we help you to get to your next place? How do we help you recreate your whole life that your loved one has been murdered? And um, never really 
seeing those kids. And so I ask families every day, like, well, did your victim have, did he have children? You know, does he have siblings? You know, oh, they're fine, they're fine. Just because people can't really wrap their minds around where they are. So not alone take care of somebody else. And, and I kind of see that, that there's some trends that we have going on. If, so research says that if a kid doesn't receive some sort of intervention from a trauma this significant, if there is no specific intervention, these kids are more likely by 14 to be in the juvenile justice system or worse. I saw that last year. I saw witnessed in the courtroom with families, teenagers under 18, charged with murder. And um, doing a little research on a couple of the kids that I saw last year, um, they had parents that had been murdered as well. We've known for years that we had to do something. We just had some ideas, but never really any backing or funding to put behind it. And um, this was just that opportunity, like the epitome of it all. Shoot this, not that is something. It's something, it's, it's different, it's unique. Nobody done it before. You know, everything that we pretty much did around even being able to develop this process was, um, was pretty, you know, based on evidence, of course, based on research, but, but it was just all of us. Everybody that worked on this team, every kid that was a part of this group, everybody had to give a whole ton of themselves, you know, to go inside places that they necessarily wouldn't talk about. And that's what you'll see in this documentary. It's like the inside places that people don't talk about. Adults like Jennifer and Karen are just part of the reason Shoot This Not That is such a success. Next on Let's Talk Cincy, the young people becoming an ear to the kids and teens healing from trauma. Shoot This Not That puts a camera in the hands of kids who have lost their loved ones to gun violence, but it's their special young mentors that really help pull the special moments out of them. I'm 18 years old and I am a senior at Mount Notre Dame High School. I'm 17, I'm a senior at DePaul Christopher High School. Something different that we had never really done and I am in a photography class actually, so I, that was something that I had a passion for already. Um, and so kind of combining that with service was something I was excited to do, so. I've always been doing community service, whether it's helping at a homeless shelter or going to give kids things, presents for Christmas or something like that. And I've known Emma since the sixth grade. So when she texted me and was like, hey, I need you to help with this project, I was like, okay. And I love photography, so I was instantly drawn in to what we were doing to helping the kids. So explain to me what the photography aspect of this is. Explain to me how that works. We ask uh, the kids like where would they want to take a picture somewhere that makes them happy and somewhere that makes them sad. So we took them to those places and we had them take those pictures. Of course we helped them take the pictures because we know we kind of knew a little bit more where to capture the best okay. spots. So we helped them with that just allowing them to express themselves instead of using a gun or using something that could be harmful. We wanted them to use a camera to use their voice. We talked a lot of about photo voice with them and at first they had no idea what that was um, and so photo voice is basically using your camera or any type of art but specifically photo mm -hmm. um, to express your emotions and so for these kids they obviously have a lot of emotions flowing whether it be sometimes super highs or low lows but using that inside to express in a positive way that would you know it affect us you know in a good way. I'm sure that this was filled with life lessons for both of you. I think for me, it would be seeing the evolution of the kids and how much they opened up. Um, that first week that we came, I know specifically a couple kids, um, our girl Bree, she had her hood up, she was, you know, head was always down, not super w wanting to be there and just opening up. And by that last week, she mm -hmm. was like this social butterfly. She was yeah. excited to be there. You could see her hood was down, mm -hmm. or, you know, she was ready to go. And so I think, although it's not emotional to some people, definitely for the mentors, just seeing how much our work and dedication made her open up and we were seeing the real Brie from that standpoint, so that's, yeah. 
Obviously, you guys see when this happens on the news and we cover it, right? Yeah. And, you know, especially that string, I keep going back to this, but that's what sticks out in my mind. You know, we had 14-year-old after 14-year-old after 14-year-old. Yeah. When you all saw that, especially being teenagers, what was your reaction to that? So I think for me, especially before this experience, I just would have been like, oh, another bad situation. They probably came from a bad home. There were bad influences. But I think from this experience, it's so much more than that. So seeing those kids, it's not always their fault. They, you know, we're, we're lucky to be raised with um, good morals and we're guided in the right direction. And a lot of these kids are not just that, like um, Karen said, a lot of them come from parents that have either been murdered or have done the murdering. And so they don't know any different and they're not learning that that's a bad thing. So when you're not blaming the kid that they're a bad kid, it's just that's how they were raised. And so we're, that's the whole point of this project. I feel like it's to change that social norm for them and kind of change and show them that they are worth it, that you, this is wor all worth it in the end, whether it's the big picture of obviously stopping gun violence in the end, but just each individual kid is definitely worth it. They're not a bad kid, it's just where they are. They have so much talent and so much intellect that's inside of them that they haven't been able to bring out. And having this project and being able to bring out of them is just, it's so amazing to see that bond that they have and the perspective that they're also bringing to the table. I think that's what really makes this project so special. Up next, how the project helped the kids of two Cincinnati police officers fight crime for themselves. So often we see the end product, but there's a lot of truth behind the lens. We wanted to talk to the folks who put this together to see what they learned from this process. Speed. Speed. All right. Just please do me a favor. Clap one time right in front of your face. I think the biggest takeaway that I had from this whole project was the fact that, and the goal of this film was to dive into the what's left of the families. And it's not, you know, once the headlines die down and you see the shooting of the victim and you see their picture, you don't see the rest of the family. After the news cycle is over with, you have children and relatives and friends of violence that have to pick up their pieces and pick up their lives when they've been impacted by something that's so final. All they know is that spot at the wall where he was assassinated, where he was murdered. But now we got two men Two young men that are trying to figure out how to become men, surrounded in a family full of women because somebody senselessly killed his father, killed his uncle, and now they don't have a direction. Within these tragic crimes, we find the humanity behind the compassion of what these officers feel and uh, the compassion that the social workers deal with with the kids. And they really become, you know, seeing it firsthand and watching the footage and the interactions and everything. They really become, you know, their children. They kind of take them in as well. So this program offers these mentors to give these kids direction. We taught them the things that they need to know to be young leaders in their community. I think one of the, the biggest takeaways for some of the, the children that they didn't realize is through taking these pictures is they've found a new skill and they've found a new passion and they've found a new outlet. And even at the, the premiere that we had at Xavier University, there were kids that showed up with their cameras still around their neck and snapping pictures of everything. And so they found something that they've really, you know, latched onto. Watching the kids walk in and their eyes light up to see the things that they've done. It, it was amazing. And they were like, we did it. And you know, and that's how I felt um, standing there watching them as we did it. We made this happen. My main hope for this film is that it truly does change the city and it opens people's eyes and especially to the no snitching mentality that, you know, the officers said it best that being a witness to a crime is being a witness, it's not, you're not telling on somebody. Um, if you know something and if you see something, you need to say something. Um, and I, I pray that, you know, if there's people out there that have seen this film, that they feel the pain that these families are still going through, even years after these murders. And there's so many of them are unsolved. And I just pray that if we can solve one case through this film, 
that we did our job. It's really the people that are behind the lens that are truly the heart of this project. And it doesn't stop just there. The kids of two police officers answered the call to serve by getting involved with Shoot This Not That, bringing a very fresh perspective. So how did you guys even get involved in this? So my mom's a Cincinnati police officer and so one day I was in Karen Rumsey's office with her while she was picking up something and Karen asked me, or my mom told me to tell Karen about my capstone project that I did, which involved photo voice. And um, so I told Karen about it and then Karen said, oh my gosh, you have to do it with these kids. And then that's sort of how it all started with Karen and photo voice. I'm a uh, Xavier University social work intern for uh, Karen. So when I started in August, I heard bits and pieces of it. But up in September, that's when she laid the project out. And she told me who was going to be involved, what we were doing. So once I heard that, I started running towards it. And I got excited. I think like the biggest thing that stood out to me was that photography is something that I've done since I was little. And um, just being able to take something that I love and teach kids about it and show the other mentors how to use the camera so that they can show the kids and just bringing that kind of skill all together as like an outlet for the kids was cool because I didn't really expect how big this kind of turned out. For me, I think it was the photography as an intervention. I think um, the kids we have in the group, um, they wouldn't really do well in a traditional therapy sense of sitting in front of a therapist or anything like that. So uh, using photography as an intervention was probably the coolest thing to see. Before this project, just from having parents who are in this field, did you feel like you really understood the extent of violence, especially violence in youth in our city? I don't think I really understood. I think it was just simple for me as seeing, watching the news and seeing the person who did it and the person who, who passed away and leaving it at that and moving on. But working on this project, I've seen now the generational effect of now kids growing up without parents and how the bullet kind of altered their uh, generational tra trajectory a little bit of the path that they would have been on or the dreams that they could have had are now altered in a way. So I think now, being a part of this project, you see the effects from every angle, and not just what you see on TV. Yeah, I don't think I understood it completely, but I definitely thought that I had a good understanding of it. But you never, like they said, think about how the kid sees it and how it impacts kids, because it's usually always parents that you need to work with, especially moms. But just seeing that the kids are so impacted by it and that a lot of them don't think that they can, that anything positive can come from it at all. So being able to, create something that the kids can use um, as that outlet is really cool. A lot of people argue with me and say that this is only happening in certain communities. It's only happening in communities of color or it's only happening in the inner city. You know, what did you guys find? It affects everyone. Um, it just depends on where you want to go to hear about it, if you decide to ignore it. Uh, but it's everywhere. Uh, we had a total of 25 kids, I believe, and um, 11 interns. and. Um, over the six weeks, every Saturday, we just came ready to work. We had fun. Um, it was, we had, it was like a roller coaster. You know, yeah. we started off down a little bit, but we had to get to the, to the root of, the, of what the trauma was. But um, after that, we we were on the way up. So, have you all been surprised at how the documentary has been received? Yeah, it's something so unique that you kind of it's the we're the first people to do something exactly like this and figure out how everything has to be. It's all been like just ideas from all of us. So to see people be so interested in it and wanting to share it with people and invite other people to come see it or watch it on the news is really cool. It is so amazing to see how passionate young people are in this project. They really are the change that they want to see. Coming up, the charge they have for people to get into action. It's been amazing to see all the creativity and the hard work through each stage of this project, but it's all for one purpose, to really have a change in the city of Cincinnati. What's the call to action at this point? So after people see this, what do you want? We want people to know that there's room for the kids. So we want um, children who are interested in becoming part of this program to contact us. Uh, there are way more children than, than we know of that have been exposed to gun violence that could benefit from this. So reach out if you know somebody, if you've been impacted by gun violence or you have a child that has. And um, we want you to be aware. We want you to, to get educated on um, see something, say something, and honor those people that come forward to talk about the cases. 
uh, cases can't get solved. Our investigators are one of the best in the nation, but we can't do it without witnesses. You know, these are really people's lives. You know, some of the kids in the program that uh, will never meet their fathers, that will never, little girls that will never dance with their dads, it's, it's real personal. And there are people out here that have the answers and maybe they just don't know how to come forward. It's so important. You know, when you look in a kid's face, you know, it's, it's like to me, it's a call to be accountable. I have to be accountable for what I know. I just want people to know, um, you know, when you watch TV at night and you see what happens during the day on the news, um, just, just think past what you see as far as who the victim is. Um, just think about who's left behind a little bit and um, the kids who are, who are now without their parents a little bit and see what the next 10 to 15 years may be like in our city if we continue to do this and um, we continue to let kids go without being helped. I just want people to know that anybody can be involved in it. We're all just normal people who want to make a difference. So I think if a lot of normal people come together who want to make a difference, then it's not something that can't happen. It's very possible and it takes everybody's ideas to make it what it was this time. So if we could do something again, um, similar to this, but maybe different with new people, then I think it can just keep impacting other communities. All of our actions have effects, what, you know, negative or positively. And so I just think people need to see that this is even worse than we see it. I think in the, you know, in the media, there's a lot of gun violence and you see every day, oh, this person was shot, this person was killed from this, and it's become normal and we need to reverse that normalcy and realize how serious this is. Step up, like there's kids out here who need help and the parents obviously aren't gonna do it and they don't have mentors. Step up, you know, let them know that you're here because that's kind of like what we had to do, like, hey, I'm here, I know you're going through a hard time, I know this is rough, but I'm here if you wanna talk to me, I don't care if you wanna scream at me, I don't care if you wanna cry. It's okay, I'm here, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here for you. Wow, unity among defenders. As you can see, this is definitely a program and an effort that's going to grow throughout time. Really having a kitchen table conversation about an issue that's very real in our community, which you know is what we like to do here on Let's Talk Cincy. Well, that will do it for us here on LTC. We are so thankful that you joined us today. And of course, we want to hear from you. Send us your ideas and any conversations that you want to have at LTC at WLWT.com. And of course, you can always see full episodes of stories from Let's Talk Sensi by going to the menu tab of WLWT.com and clicking on Let's Talk Sensi. Of course, we will see you next week for another Let's Talk Sensi. And remember, stay encouraged.